Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Moore. I lead the team at ACSI, and it's such a privilege for me to welcome all our participants this afternoon to this afternoon's webinar. With me, I've got uh, my dear wife, Kathy Moore, who works with us in the office, who looks after the ECD uh, sector in the office, and uh, she's going to be co-hosting this afternoon with us. And then our special guest is Serene Stang. Uh, a special welcome to you. Uh, Sarain, and uh, look for, looking forward to hearing what you've got to share with us a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, but just very briefly from my side, um, with this whole COVID uh, season that we're in, um, we're serious about equipping our teachers as well as we can to uh, enable them to continue this, um, this journey of, of Christian education. And uh, uh, obviously, as teachers, you've obviously found it uh, quite a challenging time. And um, so that's what we're doing every week. We have a, a webinar, uh, one for ECD, then the next week is for leaders and uh, the week after for teachers. And uh, we're just trying to keep the momentum going where we continuously just equip ourselves to be the best that we can be, all that God's called us to. So um, for those participants that we have, we've got almost 100 of you that have logged on. Thank you so much for giving of your time this afternoon. I really hope and pray that uh, it's gonna be a, 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 a time of learning uh, and an encouragement for you um, this afternoon. So um, not only for this afternoon, you are welcome to, to attend any of the webinars that we have from here on in and to invite your friends. We particularly would love to invite those public school Christian teachers um, who may not have the support that um, our ACSI school teachers do have. Um, so feel free to advertise the webinars as we advertise them. We would love to have as many people as possible um, join us. Uh, we do even have some school, uh, teachers from uh, Zimbabwe, uh, which is wonderful. If, if we've got some of you out there, uh, a, special, a, a special welcome to you. And then a special welcome to those teachers who are not part of ACSI. Uh, it's, a, it's a real joy and a privilege to have you with us. Just quite simply, the, 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 the practical things for today. Once I'm finished, I'm going to hand over to Kathy. Kathy's going to introduce our guest uh, and then pray for her. And then um, we'll get off the video and then leave it up to Sarain for about 35 minutes and she'll speak um, just about what she wants to share with us this afternoon and then you are um, able to ask some questions and we really would love to have some questions from the participants. Um, so on, on the bottom of your screen you'll see the question and answer section there. Um, if you can just uh, put your questions in we'll try and answer all the questions that you ask. So then for the last 15 minutes of the webinar we will deal with question and answers and often that's where uh, a lot of the learning actually happens. Um, also for your information, those of you who have registered and those of you who uh, are participants, uh, we will uh, issue you with a certificate that you can submit to SAIS for your safe SAIS points. But remember, you have to stay for the whole uh, webinar. You can't cheat and go after five minutes and then expect the certificate. So um, we, can, we can control that and check that. But uh, we will help you with those SAIS points as well and send them through to you. So while I'm just um, talking, I'm going to share the polls. So if you wouldn't mind, there are three questions that I'd, I'd like you to quickly answer um, uh, and just tell us where you, where you live, where you're from, 
And then um, uh, the second question relates to what school you're from, either an ACSI school or another independent school, and then um, what uh, phase of, of uh, teaching you're in. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a, a couple of seconds while I finish speaking to um, answer the polls. There you go. A lot of you are doing them, and we'll try and give you the, the, the results there. So thank you so much for, for doing that. I'll take that off the screen in a minute. But also just to mention, um, the, the next couple of webinars that we are going to be hosting next week, we're focusing on leaders, but that doesn't only mean it's leaders, but anyone can come. Um, we really want to keep the discussion open about um, racism. Um, and it's, and it's, it does come off the, 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 the social media um, uh, that's been going around just on the, the hashtag uh, Black Lives Matter, and they certainly do matter. But, you know, often we, 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 we go back to, to default mode, as it were. And we want to just raise that issue again and just have a discussion. We've got two wonderful guests who are going to just help us as schools in particular, um, just make sure that we are, we are on top of our game as far as prejudice is concerned and especially racial prejudice. So that will be next week. The week after, um, we've got uh, a guest, Judy Clippen, who's going to come and speak to us as teachers, and all teachers will be welcome, on um, uh, COVID fatigue. And she specializes not only in COVID fatigue, which she's spoken about or, or researched, but also compassion fatigue. And uh, we are concerned about you as teachers, about your well-being. It's been a rough season for teachers across this time. And we want to just equip you as well as we can. So that's something to look out for. The last thing I want to do before I hand over to Kathy is just uh, honor you teachers. Um, it's just been, as I said, an incredible season since March. Many of you haven't even had a holiday. Um, since the COVID lockdown. And uh, I just hear news from, from school leaders in particular, how proud they are of, of the teachers. And um, uh, just to honor you for the work that you've, that you've done and um, for your heart, for your ongoing passion for, for, uh, for Christian education. And I just want to encourage you just to keep going. I know that some of you are almost on holiday or have been on holiday, but uh, just remember how, how the Lord is using you to encourage your, um, your students, your parents in your classroom, and your whole community. And may the Lord bless you for being such um, a blessing. So from my side, that's it. Thank you for joining us on our webinar, and I'm going to hand over to Kathy. Okay. Well, welcome to this beautiful day. We're having an unusually warm day in Johannesburg this afternoon after a very cold start to this winter. So welcome to everybody. And it really is an honor for ACSR to be hosting you this afternoon. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was ha having a virtual cup of coffee with um, one of the heads here in Joburg. And she was telling me about an occupational therapist that works at her school. And... Um, she just mentioned that Serain had, had said what a negative effect this whole COVID situation has been on the children. And something resonated in me and I just needed to find out more. So we'd just like to thank Serain for agreeing to be our host this afternoon. Apparently she's done quite a few of these talks. So we, I'm really, really excited to hear what she has to say and what she has to share for, with us. Um, but more about Serene Stane, she grew up in Pretoria and then went on to Takis to study psychology. After she qualified there, she went overseas um, and did some schooling in Switzerland and then on to Texas. After that, she came back to OT and um, to Takis and studied to be an occupational therapist. Serene has been in um, private practice in Johannesburg for the last 20 years and she is Qualified, she's a qualified sensory integration specialist, um, which, which I have a special interest in. She also has a strong interest in autism and developmental disorders. Um, Serena is also, a, and I've never heard of this one until today, and I've, so I googled this quite a bit this morning, <laughs> a TRE provider, which is a trauma and tension release exercise activity um, that she does with children, especially that are going through trauma. And she said she's been inundated during this time um, with children suffering from trauma. So Seren, 
Um, thank you for agreeing to come, come in to chat and share what you had to share with us today. But can we just open in prayer quickly? Thank you. Father, I just thank you for all the participants that have joined our Zoom um, this afternoon. And thank you for putting a common interest in our hearts, and that is the well-being of children. Mm. Lord, we just thank you for the hearts of teachers that have gone out and walked the extra mile just to be able to support families and support children this time during this time, Lord. We don't underestimate the trauma that these children have been under, Father God, but you put these teachers in their lives for a reason in this time. Thank you for all the participants that have come this afternoon, Lord, and we just are very grateful to people like Serene for sharing with us so that we can be enriched and learn more about um, what the children are dealing with at this stage. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Sean. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege. It's a blessing to share thoughts and um, experiences with others. Um, I wish I could see all of your faces. I laughed. I said to Kathy just now, I did a talk before a while back and they also gave me a black screen and I'm like, oh, I'm too autistic. I cannot deal with a black screen. It needs to chat back to me. But I believe you on that side and I hope what I share today will resonate with you and that you will carry a message with you and hope because I think that's what we need in the time of today is hope. And I think... Um, yeah, we'll get to everything. Um, if you have any questions, um, you know you can answer, ask the questions and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so here we go. All righty. So um, I would love to share. We've been open um, for a while um, um, during lockdown. Um, initially, we started our practice up again on request of parents, desperate request to please open up again as they were having a lot of trouble with um, their children and especially our autistic spectrum group of little individuals. Um, and through when the door started opening, we had a lot of experiences and um, with all the tension and the trauma and the emotional strain that the families have been going through. So I hope what I share with you today will just give you some guidelines, will give you some insight into what is happening out there and just to support you in your amazing role as teachers, I think, and I'll get to that a little bit later. I think you're more important than a lot of other um, professions at the moment. Um, so yeah, so what is the new norm? What is the, everybody talks about, it's never going to be the same. And I'm like, oh my word, what is it going to be like? Um, we don't know. But what it is like at the moment is that we are confined within certain boundaries. We cannot move freely um, to go see family, to go see loved ones. We are confined to um, certain areas on a playground. We um, need to apply social distan distancing, which I think is a very difficult thing for a South African culture. We are a culture of hugs and contact and, um, and just being close. Um, I think when I lived in Switzerland, that's the thing I experienced the most was the fact that they are not people like us. We are warm, loving, touchy-feely people, um, and they're much more distant. Um, so social distancing is a playing a significant role in our lives these days. We are under a lot of financial and emotional strain as parents, as teachers, as just the, the adult population in South Africa. Um, there's strain on our roles as individuals within our home environment. Um, during the lockdown, I think a lot of parents really just developed a stronger sense of gratitude towards teachers. I, I really would just say I'm in awe of what you guys are doing and how you're doing the things. I'm an OT and I work with children. I have a passion for children. And, but I must say when I had to teach my three sons, um, shoo, that was another ball game to try and manage three little boys 
um, and their curriculum. So I do not know how you guys do 25 or 21 or how many you have at a class 18 and up. Um, I take my hat off and I applaud you for what you are doing. And then the other thing that's the new norm is learning through virtual platforms. So those, that's the things that people are saying is the new norm. But I must say it's not normal. And I think that's something really important we have to consider when we look at our little ones. Um, is that nothing of this is normal for them. It's abnormal. It's against their natural way of development. And we'll talk about development just now a little bit more. Um, so, and that's the, the, the strain of all these changes are putting so much, um, it's having such a significant effect on them emotionally. And often we don't see the emotion, we see behavior. We see, we see little ones running around, hitting things, throwing things. I must be honest, this week, um, it was quite interesting that a lot of the little ones that I saw in therapy was really, they were asking, can I hit something? I want to hit something. And it's just a subconscious way of wanting to get rid of all this negative energy that's within them. That, so I ended up blowing up balloons. And this is something that you maybe can use in the classroom. Blowing up balloons and throwing them on the floor. And I gave them um, a plastic sword you can buy at what, any crazy store, any little um, toy shop. And I said they could hit that or they could jump on the balloons and they can sit on the balloons and they can pop the balloons. It was the most amazing experience and moments of relief when you could see those little ones just jump on them and hit them and sit on them. And, and, and it never escalated to aggressive behavior, but it was just a way of getting rid of that that tension that they're carrying with them. And they can't make sense of it. They can't make sense of all this tension all the time. Even though we think we can verbally explain it and reason with them, their little bodies cannot understand this. So that was an awesome thing that I did this week with the little boys. I Another time I made pinatas, little boxes, that I just take masking tape and I put... Um, little pieces of Lego in there and we hit all the boxes and then we build a, a Lego structure afterwards, but a way to get rid of all this, this tension in their bodies. So yeah, the new normal is not normal and it's causing a lot of strain on our little ones. The other aspect that I think is very important for you as teachers is really to understand that we need to look at these little people holistically. And when I speak holistically, it's not being language and all of those aspects, but the family. I think your role is going to change as teachers a little bit more these days. I think you're going to become confidants for parents. You're going to become a shoulder to cry on for a mom or a dad who's lost his job. You're going to become the ear that needs to listen to the emotions that they are carrying with them. There's a lot of heartache that started happening. A lot of my parents, oh, I, the kids I see has lost their jobs. A lot of them has had significant salary cuts. Um, and that is also causing a lot of strain on them. So how does that affect the children? We, as humans, have mirror neurons. So when a little baby, um, I think often when a little baby, if you move your mouth, they do the same movement. If you're very intrigued in a story that somebody is telling, then you're, you will often see people's faces move the same as that, that person who's telling the story's faces. So that's mirror neurons. They pick up the, the neuro messaging from the other person. So often parents will try to keep it all together. But the mirror neurons in the children pick up all the strain, the emotional strain that the parents are experiencing. And then we see certain behaviors with children and we cannot understand it. The parents would say, but uh, we haven't shared anything with the children. We're trying to keep it all calm and, calm and organized and try not to make them worry, but they pick it up. So I think when we see behavioral elements in our children, 
we need to understand that they are picking up emotional strain from within the home environment. So when we look at children, we would need to look at them holistically and within a family structure. So let's talk about COVID and the effect on their development. So when we look at the development of children, we look at certain areas. We look at physical, language and communication, cognitive and socio-emotional. We're going to chat about each little aspect a little bit and just as the effect of COVID on that area of development. And then we'll talk about some things that you can maybe do in the classroom. Um, the first area is physical development. So what COVID caused is a lot of lack of play. So children learn through play. They learn through engagement with toys with the environment around them. When we put them in confined spaces, they can actually not use that natural way of learning to learn. The children need to move. They need to run, jump, roll, swing, play. Pre little preschoolers, movement is your most important aspect in development. And that's why I often recommend that when they are in preschool, table time is limited. Movement is needed for children to develop neuro connections within the brain. Every time a child moves, a neuro pathway develops. Every time a child catches a ball, kicks a ball, climb a tree, roll over the grass, all neuro connections within the brain gets boosted. And that helps to build the communication between all aspects within the brain, the language area, the emotional center, the, the visual center, the um, higher executive executive functioning areas, their um, reasoning skills, all the, all the frontal cortex, all those areas in the brain get connected. When we limit their play to seated positions, the, um, in enclosed spaces like a, a bedroom where they cannot run, when they cannot climb, we limit that stimulation. We limit sensory stimulation. Children love to run and jump and get dirty and explore and find things and open things and close things. And those are the things that they need to build those neuro connections. Now, during lockdown, that was limited. The one big worry that came out of lockdown for me, and I could see it in my own children, is screen time. A lot of the parents, and I think that's part of the strain that was placed upon them, is they need to now teach as well. They need to teach, they need to work, and they need to earn. They need to nurture, they need to clean the house, and they need to prepare dinners. That was all the roles, and even more, I think. But to be able then to work, I think a lot of parents reverted to, here's an iPad, here's a, a video, there's television, go sit so that they can work, which is understandable. They also need to function. They also need to produce what they needed to. But that virtual um, screen time has such a negative effect on the development within the brain that because the kids do not have to have any other neuro connections other than just the visual that they use, that is really a big concern. I took my son the other day to the optometrist to have his eyes tested. And she said, Serene, we're going to have a big problem. And I said, why? What's going to happen? And she said, Serene, the screen time has affected the binocular control of our children so significantly that we're going to have a lot of reading difficulties. So that is another negative of the COVID is on the nervous system is the lack of play, the lack of physical engagement, the lack of movement. And my and what I think teachers, especially within this first month or two of being back at school, is to see if we can provide them with those opportunities to run. It's amazing to see when we got out of lockdown and when we could start going for walks. I mean, my middle one does not like walking. He, he's my sedentary one. But even he just got up and said, let's run, let's run, let's go ride bikes. They, they crave what they need for their nervous system to develop. And I think when we now have kiddies in a classroom, 
and even when they do online schooling and you think this child cannot sit still, they have been deprived of movement for a, at least two months and not move me. Yeah, they can move around in the house, but I mean running, really playing soccer with their friends, rolling with their friends, rough and tumble with their friends. They had a lack of that. So we need to give them the opportunity to feed that need to build that neuro connections again we need them to start moving i my recommendation and is to have more movement time in this first two months than tabletop time i know we are pressured to work through curriculums but if we want to catch up the effect of COVID on these nervous systems we need to give them the time to move move have them run up the soccer field have them do the things go back to basics have them do the things that we did when we were little having um those races where you jump in a bag let them run with something on a spoon an egg on a spoon um get them to be physical outside in the sun through movement the secretion of dopamine and serotonin takes place that will help lift the mood of our children, which is also, we've been also seeing that it's a lot more depressive, sedentary, I'm constantly tired, I don't wanna do this. It will boost that and pick that, that up again. So movement and physical play is, is a very important part of our responsibility when now going back and pr providing them with that support. When we continue with online schooling, I think it would be very important to include that as well, not just curriculum, getting to learn the letters, the, the shapes, the sizes, the, those cognitive things, but to put in movement stuff into our engagement, even over, um, over a Zoom session, let them say, run down the passage, jump 10 times and come back, get them to move. That's very important. Language and communication is our next area. I think, Again, the virtual world of iPads and cell phones and games on phones has affected that. Um, I'm not a speech therapist, um, but I do see the effect of COVID and especially the wearing of the mask, which is crucial. I understand we have to do that. But the wearing of masks and how kids actually sometimes cannot engage with you with your mask on where they i have a little boy that said to me the other day i cannot play with you if i can't see you and i said to him but you can see me he said but i can't see your mouth and it was so cute for me and even our facial expressions they read that and they engage with that and they learn from that and they get where they are with regards to are they being are they doing it right or doing it wrong they can't see these faces so it's affecting that communication on a non-verbal level language wise very please keep in mind if children have auditory processing difficulties and you have a mask on where they cannot read your lips or where the sound is muffled by the mask it's very difficult for those children to follow instructions if you have identified a few in your classroom that do have auditory processing difficulties, I would actually keep them closer, closest to you, social distance, but closest to you with regards to, so that he can, or he or she can hear you clearly. And even if you can wear the shield, then when you give instructions, then take the mask off and give it the instructions through the shield so that they can actually gauge from oral movements what you are saying to them. So from that point on a language and communication um, level is try to do that with your children. Um, children's language develop when they play with their peers when they engage with their peers who actually speak on the same level as them they have been deprived of that for the period of lockdown it was interesting my son said to me the other day mom do you think kids will still like me and i said to him boy why would you say that and he said maybe i'll tell them a joke and they won't understand the joke so we, don't, we underestimate the effect of being confined to communication, uh, to the development of communication, that they start questioning themselves because they can't get the feedback from those friends. So provide the children with opportunities to share, 
opportunities to communicate verbally with each other, to, to make noises with their voices, get them to activate that auditory processing by making different noises, by copying different noises, by dancing to music. That's probably the best thing you guys can do at the moment because music activates the brain. Music also, together with the movement, activates or sec activate the secretion of all the good feel-good hormones. Music is a lovely way of getting rid of emotional strain. So those are the things that you can use. And then you can play auditory games with them as well. That is an aspect that was also because parents would give them instructions, say, hey, do this quickly. But there's no explanation. So that auditory entunement has also deteriorated a little. So work on that and just engage on that level with them. Then we go to the cognitive development. Well, again, the parents will say, we got all these apps on the phones and the the virtual um, screens that the kids can learn to put puzzles together and forms and numbers and those kind of things. Again, on a preschool level, children cannot integrate skills if they don't have a full body activation. So when you do, when they go back to school now, get the physical in with the cognitive jump on the triangle go hop on all the draw a lot of triangles and circles on a, on the paving in front of your classroom let them hop on go hop on the, all the triangles then they hop go hop on all the circles and then you can go to to floor or to table and say okay now what is the shape and integrate so make it a multi-century experience draw all the the shapes numbers letters draw it in shaving cream, build it with pasta. Um, yo, there's so many different things that you can do to use the multi-century, get the tactile system, the auditory system, even the um, olfactory, which is your smell system, included in all the learning that takes place now because they were sensory deprived from experiences with all different textures. Um, just having to be do the same thing over within the house now get full sensory experience it's, it's it's these leaves on the on the lawns make a heap put let them all rake it together lovely for bilateral integration let them jump into that um, lovely for tactile and then give them a word beforehand and say i want you to remember this word and say maybe cat and then jump in, run around that tree and come back and tell me the word again. So try to make the learning experience more sensory integrated because the way, the, the effect that it had on their nervous systems, if we go down to tabletops now and try to catch up on what we've lost for this little bit of the year, this first bit of the year, we're going to miss the point. We need to get the multi-century or the neuro activation again so that optimal learning can take place. Then the, the last area is the socio-emotional. That is the area that we've been seeing the most significant impact on. It's a very sad for me to, to see that. Um, I have quite a few autistic children. Um, it has had a significant impact on the autistic children. You would think that they would be would be better off at home, confined environment, but the effect on them because of the strain on the parents has been significant. Um, we've had a lot of depressed children with depression, severe anxiety disorders are starting to develop. And that's from the paranoia of having to constantly clean their hands, wash your hands, don't touch that. We have... We have a parent that comes in and he will sanitize every five minutes. It's very important to try to normalize what's happening at the moment. I asked this, the play therapist the other day, give me some feedback. What do you think I can, advice I can give when I chat to all these people? And she said, try to normalize. And I said, how, what do you mean? And she said, Serene, everybody is talking about all the different things. No, how school is going to be different. But nobody is saying, how is it going to be the same? It's going to be the same teacher. It's going to be the same class. So normalize things. The other cue words that she gave me, which was significant for me, is calm creates calm. 
try to remain calm. The other day I had a session with a little boy and another therapist who works with me had a session um, just by accident in another room with this little boy of mine's best friend. And I, we came out of the rooms at the same time and these two saw each other and they jumped up and they were like, oh, my friend. And they ran and me and the other therapist both screamed, don't hug. Uh, it was too late. They gave each other a hug. And that caused them to freeze when we screamed. They gave each other a hug and then they, they, they had this realization of, oh my word, what did we just do? This, this invisible monster is now going to jump on us. And there I realized the calm needs to create calm. They need to, we need as teachers, as parents, and this is where you as teachers come in to create the calm within the parents calm to stay calm if something happens to remain the calm and to keep the waters smooth there's so many ripples we need to smooth the waters for these little ones the other thing that is very important is what they've been living with this year is a lot of unpredictability unpredictability for children causes a lot of emotional strain my recommendation has been, and even before lockdown, is if there is um, anxiety in children, which is now more than ever, try to set a routine and structure, but on a visual level that they can see. What is our week going to look like? This, and have, have a visual chart where you say Monday, and if you're talking about fish, have a fish, and we're going to play outside for that amount of time we're going to um, draw for that amount of and just stick pictures of the sequence of what the day is going to look like um, for the week it works a charm try to provide predictability for the children the other thing that this play therapist said is try to give an identity to this corona so everybody's corona and we have these little cute kids that come in and say the coronavirus but nobody has ever, we haven't given it an identity of what it looks like. It's this imaginary monster out there that's going to kill people, that makes people die. So we, we've been doing it in the practice where we ask the kids, okay, give, draw me a picture of what this corona looks like. And we have Quibus the corona, so we give them a name. And just so that they can it can normalize the virus for them. And then we talk about the effect of the corona and how it can be carried over because that's what they need to know, but not in a paranoid way. We need to remain calm and not cause paranoia. We wash our hands, but it's not like, oh, have you washed your hands? Oh, you need to wash your hands. It's like, oh, remember guys, we need hands to be washed. So we need to normalize that. We need to provide children with time for expression of their emotions. Um, I think we are pressured with curriculums and there's, a, there's actually a saying that I wrote down that I want to read to you. Um, sometimes the things your ch students need most right now has nothing to do with, with what's on the lesson plan. And I think that is where US teachers have a big role to play now. I think there's a lot more emotional support that needs that's needed than educational support at this moment um, and provide children with a safe space to express their emotions um, they can build it with clay they can draw it they can um, they can just tell you but provide them with those opportunities to do that and another recommendation is to go slow I know you are pressurized. I know you've got curriculums, but remember if the building blocks of development are set, whatever follows is easier. If the auditory awareness and ability to discriminate sounds, the ability to see the difference in pictures, to find something in a busy background, to, to feel something and say, oh, I know what this is. This is a car. When all those basic building blocks are set in place, learning that follows is going to be much faster. So try to slow down. Go back to basics. Don't rush. Because if you miss a little building block now, it will have an effect later. So try to see, make sure that you spend time on the building blocks. Then um, 
So those are the biggest things that I think one can support you guys with. You have an amazing role. You are more important than anybody ever give you recognition for. And I want to thank you for being the most influential people in our children's lives. Um, so yeah, that's in a, in a nutshell, just a little bit of our experiences, a little bit of advice that we can give. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, Kathy or Sean, then be ready for it. <laughs> um, participants, we'd really love you to start typing in questions um, so you can interact with Serene. But Serene, just listening to that, it's everything that you know within your heart, but you hear it can just has just wants to make me weep for time lost, um, development time lost with the children. I think one of the saddest things is that our schools went into lockdown about 10 weeks into the year. And we know that relationship with the teacher is cemented usually from the second term on, where trust is formed with the parents. Um, I know a lot of teachers have had a positive experience in that line with the parents online, but there's just so many areas that have affected our children. Mm. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with um, a question because I have many phone calls um, from teachers, especially great art teachers, asking how are we going to evaluate the children? A lot of children go for school readiness assessments um, starting at this time of the year. Um, how's that going to impact, impact the results of that? And are our children going to be ready for the formal schooling situation when they get to grade one next year? I don't know if you could expand on that. Yeah, yeah that is a very difficult question. We had... Um, a few experiences where teachers um, assess their children over Zoom and then they came back with, oh, this kid has attention deficit disorders, the child can't sit still. Very important to realize this is not the norm. You cannot assess a child over a screen. Children's neurological makeup and is that they need to engage. They need to engage physically. They need to be in the space. To think that they're going to sit in a, uh, and look at a screen and give you the right and correct answer. Yeah, they will. They'll try their best. But it's not a natural thing. And they can't sit still and watch a screen. Their bodies are made to engage. So it's a very difficult question. And I think it's very hard to say, will they be ready? I don't know. It depends on the nervous system. But I know what I know. And that's why I said, if you spend the time for the rest of the year on the basic building blocks that's needed, whatever follows next year will be easier. If you make sure that you work on auditory processing, following instructions, listening to music, getting the discrimination of sounds, getting the letters visually, see it, um, play visual games, those are the building blocks. What if, if they don't have their letters and numbers set, but they have the auditory and the visual perceptual skill, next year they will learn it quickly. So that's not my concern if they'll be able to learn it. Is Are we going to now jump to learning that splinter skill and then miss the building blocks? Because then it's going to snowball. But if we spend our time building this neuro base that's ready for learning, that will be perfect. So... Yeah, that's a hard question <laughs> to answer. But from my point of view, if, if you be, spend the time on the building blocks, if he doesn't know one now, but he has the visual perception and the auditory, number one will be learned like that next year. Then I don't have a worry. Fully agree with you. Um, I just want to read some of the questions from my split screen. Taylor DeVette has asked, what are some emotional check-in questions that we can ask our children? just to gauge as to where they are emotionally. So it's what we've been um, doing in the, at the practice. We have pictures. Sometimes the kids struggle to tell you the emotions, but they can actually choose a picture with an emotion. They can identify a picture. So what we've been saying is like, we will have a spread of pictures and we'll say, okay, give me the picture that you feel like today. What do you feel like today? And when you get the picture, then you can say, I wonder what this picture wants to tell me. Um, I wonder if you are, it looks like this picture is worried. And then they'll say, yes, I am worried. 
And then you can have a conversation with him. But to ask a question for a preschool and say, how are you feeling today? Um, a lot of them can't give you the, the verbal. They'll be, they'll be like, oh, I'm fine. Um, what you can say in your body, do you have a place that's a little bit worried? Where in your body do you feel the worry? That they can show you if you give them the emotion. Where do you feel the sad? And they'll show you. But to ask them a question, what is your emotion? How are you feeling? That's too, that's too difficult for them. So a good strategy is to use pictures or to go to their bodies and say, I, my body feels sad today over here. And the reason is I haven't seen my mom, um, which is an old lady in an old age home for, for three weeks. And I miss her. Where in your body do you feel um, saddest? Do you feel saddest? If not, great. What, what, then you give the emotions and you ask them to identify it on their bodies. So those are ways to just check in with them. And you know what? Sometimes we rush into activities so quickly, but sometimes if you as a teacher, and I often do that in therapy, I would sit for five minutes and just watch the child, watch the children. You'll quickly pick up who is where emotionally. If you just spend the time, I call it the watch, the wait and the wonder. I watch them and I wait and I wonder, hmm, what's up with you today? So if you do that kind of thing and spend those five minutes, you'll pick up where they are emotionally without having to ask questions. Good. And the next question from Foxy, because of the social distance, how are we going to make the learners play freely? Um, you, know, you know what, it, it's interesting, it, another talk I heard, they exchanged the word social for physical. Yeah, physical distancing. Physical yeah. distancing. That's true. You, social interaction, hugely. Yeah, hugely. You know what, um, you can still kick a ball to each other. I mean, there's no, your shoe, if it's been sprayed off, there is no coronavirus on the ball if nobody touched the ball. Um, you can still have gloves, you, you know, and just running next to each other, running, having races, like I said, like the old days when we had Buddha sport, you know, and jumping in the bags and running with the egg, um, just running next to each other. That physical play um, is amazing. They, that's what they need. They just need to be do it next to each other. And then put obstacles in the way and say, okay, you have to run over that one. Don't touch them run around that one, don't touch them. So you can make it playful. It doesn't have to be like, oh, don't touch it because somebody's going to get sick, but you're going to go, oh, yeah, we got you, see? And then you as the teacher with your sanitizer and your gloves just exchange the, the element. Um, physical play doesn't have to be that they need to touch each other. They can run next to each other. They can hop next to each other. They can roll down across a, a soccer field next to each other in their own lanes. If you go out your lane, oh, my word, dear, Oh my word, you're out of it. So you can have lots of games like that where they can engage still. Um, uh, there's a game where you mimic movements. So teach them to play that masquerade. That's the word. Masquerade, they can do that kind of thing. So that's play. It doesn't have to be touch. It doesn't have to include touch. Absolutely. And then we've got Cheryl Williams. Um, she says, one of the things that I find in my Zoom class, that children find it hard to talk to each other. How can I help my children? I teach grade R. We are not going back to school only, but we are going to continue to do online teaching. Okay. Yeah, that's a hard one. Yeah, it's very difficult. You know, my kids, I, when the one said, Mom, am I going to have friends? I said, well, let's do video calls. And you know, it's really hard for them. They don't want to do video calls. So I would actually say, yeah, that they, they struggle to engage with each other over a screen, but maybe do a nonverbal engagement. Okay, if you want to say something, put your hands on your head, or um, do you want to say something to someone else, then the sign means stop or hello or make it a nonverbal. You have to start thinking playfully to get them to engage. Um, it is hard for them to, to do it on a screen. So don't expect a lot of conversations, even great R's. Mine is in grade four and they can't have conversations over the, over screens. So don't expect too much, maybe one or one word, maybe a short sentence. And I think that would be good. 
um, don't think that there's going to be long discussions like us. You'll see when we're done, we're going to be knackered. We're going to be so tired <laughs> because it's so not normal. And that's what it is. They, they can't do this normal. So on that level, I think the, expect the teachers need to shift the expectations. Don't expect long discussions. They won't be able to do long discussions. Give me a word. Give me a sentence. And that is, that is what, and you can facilitate. Sean, do you want to tell your friend Jack something? And um, maybe say to Jack the following, but don't think it's going to come spontaneous from them. That's not part of their, their makeup at this stage. Okay. And then two more questions. Um, one from Anonymous, actually. What do we tell parents when they inquire that their children, that their children are not concentrating during online learning or forgetting the work? Sure. Yeah, that's, that's what we've been having is that a lot of teachers would say there's attention deficits. Mm -hmm. um, how, number one, the question I would ask is how long is your Zoom session? How long is your Zoom class? How long do you expect the child to sit still? Um, number one, again, it's not normal to sit in front of a screen and um, learn from a screen. Have movement breaks in between. Um, if they can't remember the, um, the, the concept that was discussed, that child is not engaging. And I think that's where we as teachers and therapists have to actually take that responsibility to be a little bit out of the box and be a little bit crazy, but get them to engage. We as the practice ran some videos on, um, on our Facebook page for fine motor and gross motor things during lockdown. And we went all out nuts. I think if people have to look at us, they'll be like, oh my word, these people need to be an institution because <laughs> they we had little eyeballs on our heads and things, make it engaging. Don't make it a long lesson, lesson short bits at a time. But it is hard and I get that it's very strenuous on the teachers and to be creative now, it's asking a lot. Get your support, get friends, get, girlfriends that not even teachers ask them for advice because they have other energy that you maybe need now but limit your time that you spend on zoom trying to carry over a concept and if this child tr struggles ask the parent to do it afterwards with them maybe send them a message and say you know what i just need for you to repeat this um do not evaluate that skill, kid's skill just based on their performance on zoom i think that's not fair i'm sorry no Absolutely. And then the next question I also get asked quite a lot, and it's come up um, a lot on the questions here. How must we handle the two to three year olds, or even a little bit older, children in my class when they cry because we're not allowed to pick them up and have physical oh. contact with them? <laughs> yeah, that's also one that, you know what, I actually, we, we had that discussion in the practice because we, uh, we have all these emotional children at the moment. And you know what we started doing? We asked the parents for a blanket that they need to send to school. And when they become emotional or they bring it to therapy, we wrap them in that blanket and we just hug them. And when they're done, that blanket gets washed at the end of the, we put it in a plastic bag, gets tied up and it get washed. The kids do need the physical, the physical nurturing. That, that's something they need more than ever before is now. So even if you ask them for old towels, wrap it in you can wrap the little one's head in it and just give them a hug stand behind them and give them a hug so that it's not a face to face um but that's what we've been doing it is very difficult but the kids need it and that's where you play with this thing is might they get sick or are we going to leave an emotional scar those are the two poles of it is we need to feed this emotional strategy that uh, yeah tread yeah, that's the word that's gone. Um, yeah, the the word the bad of the emotional stuff that's happening at the moment. Um, we need to address that. We need to address the emotional. And to think you're gonna sit and watch a little one cry and not being able to hug, that's not fair on that nervous system either. So try to ask the parents to send a blanket that you can just wrap that little one in and just and face away, put your gloves on but give the hug, they need the deep pressure. Um, so that's something that we've been, we, we've been using. So I don't know if that's alternative. They must run it by the school and see if that's okay for the school to use it that way. And even the parents, they must agree to that. 
absolutely. Yeah, they say, as, as he said, um, that nothing's going to be the same. But yeah. more and more, I just think we need to take the focus off the, the academic mm -hmm. and we need to heal our children mm -hmm. emotionally. Because yeah, well, we, we, we do know that if a child's in a bad place emotionally, they're not going to be able to form, perform academically. Exactly. If there's that increased cortisol levels in the brain, it hampers the integration of neuro connections. So we need to take off that cortisol. We need to bring that cortisol levels down. And that's why it's so important. And through, through that engagement and the staying calm and the being calm and the secretion of do, um, dopamine, serotonin through movement, we counteract the effect of uh, the cortisol. Um, and that's why they, they call it, a, um, the, all the articles I've read, they said, we will only see in about five years time the effect that Corona had on the emotional development of the children. And I tell you, that is, that's not a long time. And we need to support them emotionally. And that's why I say step away from all the assessments and having to have, go to, you know what they need for building blocks. You as a preschoolers know what needs to be in place to have the learning take place. You, you are amazing teachers. We don't have to tell you that. It's the curriculums that's being brought in from external that you feel so rushed. But actually, everybody knows what's needed. I believe in the teachers and I know they know. Spend the time on that. Don't rush to have all these things, build those building blocks. Because if those, that foundation is strong, man, bring it on. Then they'll be ready. Absolutely. Um, Seren, you started your talk with a statement. You said hope is, is certainly needed. And that also resonated with me. Because if you look at the stats of the ECD centers, a lot of them not being able to open at this stage. Children that are vulnerable out there. Um, we need hope. We do need yeah. hope, and, and, and that's why I think connect, we, we can connect to correct. And sometimes if you only connect via Zoom with a child, not having to perform, but just connect, that makes a bigger difference than the child being able to tell you that's a triangle. So I think that's where we are. We have to sh shift our, our perceptions of, where we want to intervene and really focus on what is needed now. And that's why that, that saying really was very significant for me. It, the, what your students need now is not what's on the written, um, the plan, the lesson plan. It's what they need. And I think that's where we need to intervene for now. Well, Saran, you know what? I could keep you going for another hour or two at least, but our time is, is running short now. So I'd really just like to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from ACSR. And I can just imagine from everybody that's been part of this um, webinar this afternoon, um, just to say a huge thank you to you. And I'm going to extend an invite on your behalf <laughs> that Absolutely. if anybody... Mm -hmm. That if anybody would like to get hold of Serene and have further discussions with her um, or ask for advice or even maybe refer children to her, um, her details will be available or are available. Um, so please feel free to contact Serene. But thank you, Serene. We really, really do appreciate you. And then just to say in three weeks' time, we'll have our next ECD webinar and we'll have Robin Vinant from Play Schools for Africa, speaking about play deprivation. Um, also something that's really close to my heart as well. So just like to thank everybody for being with us today. And please keep attending our webinars because I learn a lot through them. I'm, I'm sure we're all learning through them. Okay, God bless. God thank bless. you, Kathy. God bless all these amazing teachers and all the work you guys are doing. May it be blessed. And thank you for reaching out. It's really appreciated. So, yeah. so God bless you all and just continue to fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>